The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Memory, connection, and a chance for redemption in the last stage of life. I'm Nam Kiwanuka, and tonight on the Agenda in the Summer, a conversation with star Louis Gossett Jr. and the director of the timely new film, The Cuban. The deadly pandemic that swept the globe and put simple pleasures like going to the movies on hold hasn't kept some creators from striking a chord with audiences. That's certainly true for Emmy and Academy Award-winning actor Louis Gossett Jr.'s new film, The Cuban. In fact, it taps into many themes that are more relevant and raw today. It's already won several festival awards, including the Audience Award at the 2020 Pan-African Film Festival. And it's a great pleasure to welcome from Atlanta, Georgia, actor Louis Gossett Jr. and from Innisfil, Sergio Navarreta, director of The Cuban. Welcome to you both. Thank you for having us. I, I watched the film, I really loved it. And for our audience, we actually have the trailer, a little bit of the trailer to show. Sheldon, could you please roll? His name is Luis and he used to be this famous musician back in Cuba. He even played the Cotton Club. He played with Bauza, Machido, Dizzy Gillespie. And he told you all of this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really play with all these people? Ladies and gentlemen, and the guitarist All this nonsense. It's a Cuban boy. Am I right? Is that you? Yeah, we've known each other a long time since we uh, but decided. A forgotten legend. And you're sure it's him? I would like to start with you, Mr. Gossett. Why did you want to do this film? Well, it's obvious, as you can see all those photographs, it brings back memories again from my high school days. But the number one music was Afro Cuban. Hmm. So some of my heroes were Tito Puente and Tito Rodriguez and Machito and Willie Bobo. Uh, that was my graduation music. And we had contests uh, about who knew what. The one note, the one note uh, mambo. And I remember the, the, there's a phrase in the movie, Todas las mujeres de la fiesta tienen que bailar conmigo. All the women of the party wanted to dance with me is the name of it. Well, what did, you, what did that translate song. into? Sorry, what you just said, what did that Sorry. translate into? All the women of the party want to dance with me because I know all the latest steps of the Afro-Cuban music. The cha-cha-cha, the merengue. It comes from my high school. So full circle, here comes this Italian guy, Sergio, mm. and he says, I want you to do this. And I said, uh, let me make it hard for you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and do you speak Spanish? Hablo <laughs> Espanol? <laughs> <laughs> so I have a lifetime uh, a friend with Sergio and his family and his little boy, and I want to thank him for bringing back those memories once again. And it was a piece of cake, but don't tell him that. <laughs> and, and do you actually speak Spanish? Hablo Espanol? Bastante para lo sobreviviendo en este mundo, no. Necesario, no. Muy importante. <laughs> very, very good. You lost me. I only know a little bit. Um, Sergio, where did uh, the genesis of the film come from? Well, I have to think uh, several years back. I was um, at the tail end of working on a, an animation movie and the schedule was quite grueling and I was uh, very anxious to get back to directing. So I met this young actress from the TV show Degrassi and uh, we had expressed a keen interest in working together. And I said, if you have any ideas, even if it's just a short film, in the spirit of doing something freeing and creative, let's let's try something. So. Um, her partner at the time, Taras Bolton, had a dream about his grandfather back in Russia who had passed away. And he was dealing with some of the guilt around that. And um, I really related to that. And, you know, you I think there guilt? was a... Sorry, Sergio, when you yes. say guilt, what do you mean? Well, I think there, there you know, there's a personal guilt uh, around, uh, around the same time my father had passed away at 71. And he had been instrumental uh, figure in the labor movement here in Canada and back in Italy. And when he died, his stories died with him. So I was that was very much on my mind. And uh, also just the collective guilt of our disconnection with our elders. Um, I was really feeling the weight of that. 
And uh, here we are in the midst of a pandemic where it's quite topical. And why was Lou Gossett Jr. the perfect person for this role? I, you know, I was, I was always a big fan uh, of Mr. Gossett. Uh, my parents sat me down when I was very young and made me watch Roots. And uh, I just remember how much that changed my life. It was just so intense. And there was a lot of conversations around the dinner table. And that was the beginning of, of sort of, uh, you know, my, my uh, appreciation for his talent. And then when I met him the first time in Malibu at his home, it really hit home when I saw the posters and all the accolades. It was uh, it was overwhelming. So it took a while to kind of get past that and uh, and then just get down to the business of, uh, you know, director actor relationship and making a movie. And Mr. Gossett, you know, in this film, mm -hmm. your character, Luis, doesn't say very much, but there is so much that is said in the silence. How are you how are you able to convey that emotion? by being as quiet as possible and listening to the words and the emotions. It's just acting one-on-one, as you say, in actor studio, to uh, not have the lines, but make the moments. My hero in films is Robert De Niro. And he did a, a film called Awakenings, if you remember that. He played a man who, in one, in one take, went from normal to, to uh, his sickness his, and, and back in one take. And I've always wanted to do that same thing. Mm -hmm. They went through, through his... Uh, his disease, and as the camera came to finish him, he was back to normal. And I, I, I envied the ability to be able to do that in camera. There's a challenge. We challenge one another. Mm -hmm. He challenges me, and I challenge him. So I had to do that all through the movie, more without line, back to the time in Cuba, back to the present time in the caregiver. It's uh, it's quite a satisfying, satisfying thing for an artist to try and do. Hopefully, I made the sense with my director that I that I accomplished. But there is so much to be said too, because you are playing someone who has Alzheimer's, and because yes. of the medication, um, they're not really themselves anymore. Tapping into that and thinking about getting older is is that on your mind? It's always on my mind. I've, I've done. I've broken some records, and I don't. People have to remind me that my profession is over almost 65 years long. Mm. I've got, I guess, every more than an actor can win. And when I started, things were really tough for us of, of this color of skin in America, much less the world and in business. And here I still sit talking to you. Um, it's a miracle. I'm very grateful for it. In order to give it back, I need to tell my story so young people know that there's something more important than our differences. Our similarities is what's going to save mankind. It's going to take mankind to save mankind. And at this point, I think your T-shirt says something. Can you just show us what your T-shirt says? Okay, I will. I'll show you a photograph. It might, might make it easier. Okay. What does that say? It says e-racism. Mm. And why is that an important message for you to convey right now? Because the only thing that's going to say what we're doing in the pandemic, war, our differences, is our similarities. We're really one species, one human species. It's going to take a mutual answer for us to come out of this problem we're having in order to save the day for us all. Nobody better, nobody worse. It's just mankind saving mankind. And I think in this film, too, you have many people from most of the characters are all from different backgrounds, Sergio. Um, Luis, uh -huh. uh, Mr. Gossett's character, is, pre uh, is befriended by a pre-med student named Mina, uh, who's mm -hmm. Afghan. Can you tell us about her character? Well, she's a, a new immigrant uh, in Canada, um, growing up with her aunt. Uh, we find out a little bit about her backstory through the course of the film. But essentially, her uh, journey, uh, I guess, mirrors a lot of uh, immigrant, uh, you know, sons and daughters of immigrant parents living in Canada. And um, I think because we live in such a multicultural society, it was easy for us to kind of express that in an authentic and honest way. Um, and it's something that in the U.S. a lot of people have commented on, uh, you know, just how do you have an Afghan nurse befriend, a, you know, a, a famous Cuban musician in a nursing home? It seems very uh, odd and unique. Uh, but in our landscape, in a multicultural city like Toronto, uh, it's very common. And, and you find common ground between these two cultures. They're both, I guess, feeling a, a displaced and they come together through the power of music. Was that intentional, making her character Afghan? Yes. Why? It was. Why? 
Um, because, you know, there's so many uh, cliches and stereotypes, and I think we want to push beyond, shift beyond our own paradigms uh, around how we see Afghan culture. You know, it's so endearing. It's such a rich and, and historically traditional culture that uh, for me, as a as a filmmaker, it was just fascinating to get into the nuances of that. And uh, I had some great consultants. I had uh, the actor Kane Mahan, uh, Sharaya Dashlu herself knew quite a bit about Afghan culture, and many others. Um, you know, we broke bread together for many many months and really got to know each other. And um, it was just important to to shine a light on such an incredible, incredibly rich culture that uh, very few people have the opportunity to discover, perhaps in the, in the Western world. So wanted to shine a light on that. Well, we have another clip from The Cuban, and this is a scene where Mina, played by actress Anna Goya, plays music for Luis. Sheldon, please roll. What role does music play in helping Luis recover his memory, Sergio? Well, I think um, there's several things at play. There's a debilitating disease, Alzheimer's, that we're learning more and more about nowadays. Um, there's isolation and loneliness, and um, and then of course there's the, the, the you know the the medications that he's taking. I think it's it's a combination of those things. And when he hears music, it stimulates a part of his brain that uh, recalls you know, positive memories of his youth. And uh, it's, it's a very powerful thing that a lot of scientists and doctors at uh, facilities like Baycrest Hospital are actually studying. It's, uh, there's scientific evidence that music has the power to bring people back to life, literally, so. Why Cuban jazz in particular? Did it just fit the story? Um, I, I grew up loving Afro-Cuban jazz, uh, Buena Vista Social Club, uh, Mambo Kings, uh, when I saw Mambo Kings, I went out and bought the, in those days, a cassette and shoved it in my car and just kept listening to it over and over again. It's just, it's so infectious. And uh, no matter what kind of mood you're in that day, it'll just pick up your spirits. And uh, when you're dealing with something like Alzheimer's, I wanted to find something that could instantly bring people into a positive state. And I think that music carries, a, you know, a beautiful culture that uh, is infectious, like I said. And Mr. Gossett, when we were playing that clip of uh, with Mina um, playing the music, you were actually kind of grooving to that clip. Um, <laughs> what does music mean to you in your life? 100% effective. Uh, it came from my great, great grandparents and stuff. And uh, it, it, it's something uh, that I got from my great grandparents. I got another photograph for you to see when I first started in show business and who helped raise me. So that's me at 17, and that's my great grandmama at the age of 115. The thing that connected us was music, started with the gospel, wound up with blues and rock and roll, and it kind of saved our life all the way through the generations. Mm -hmm. uh, so now today, the music is, is 100%. It's Afro-Cuban, it's bluesy, it's rock and roll, it's hip hop, it's all the same root. You said that music so saved, you, you say oh, that uh, music saved you. Um, how did it save you? Because there's a song that represented my emotion. I could find a song that could get me away from a, a, a anger and sadness. I could sing, uh, and I play guitar and stuff. I found a song, and, and it could be the, the theme of the day. Um, but it got me through it, and I was able to sing it with my guitar. And it really has better than medicine. And so we as a people uh, have survived with that music, even today. It's number one in all the billboards. Uh, we speak our, you know, the blues and the, the rock and roll and the R&B and the rap and it all kind of the same. It gets through to the skin and into the heart and makes us survive and think again about how much we desperately need one another. 
You know, and Sergio, you uh, touched on this earlier about the effect of the pandemic and um, the things that it's exposed to us. This movie was made before the pandemic. And yes. in the film, there was a, a scene that I just wanted to uh, ask you both about. One of the nurses says, our residents come to us for three reasons, to be fed, to have a decent place to sleep, and most importantly, to feel safe. And Nina, the character responds, he is a human being. Sergio, what were you trying to convey with that scene? Um, just, you know, uh, the message really is a return to compassion. And this pandemic has, you know, the world, uh, everybody's been put in a timeout. So it's it's really a time when we can reflect on, on issues like elderly care. And um, as I walked the halls of, of various nursing homes during the research period, um, I just began to wonder what what their stories were. And uh, I think if this film can at least ignite a little bit of a curiosity uh, in our elders, then um, you know we've done our job. But I know that uh, the head of the foundation for Baycrest said he'll never walk the halls the same way again. Um, there's mm. pictures posted outside each room with everyone's history. And uh, whether they were a princess, a doctor, you know, or a, a janitor at a school, they all have a history and a story that needs to be respected. And there's nuggets of, of knowledge there that we can all learn from. So it's really, uh, that's the theme of the message, uh, you know, I believe is, is uh, you know, just a, a whole returning back to uh, a reintegration of our elders in society. And Mr. Goss said the same kind of question yeah. to you. Um, why was that an important scene in the film? Because uh, it's proven that there is a sound that people from all uh, different cultures can identify with. It, it attracts their attention. It's been there since the beginning of time. And now we're full circle to that similar sound, full of emotion. The blues, the, the opera, it's the same. And it reunites us to tell our children that that is the most important way of communicating. Mm -hmm. That bottom line sound that has emotion to it is just something that's going to unite us all for a common energy. And, you know, when we go back to uh, what that nurse, that conversation between the nurse and Mina, and I don't want to give away too much for the people who haven't seen uh, the film, uh, but it's this idea that, you know, Luisa's character is stuck in the past and you have this compassionate young woman who shows him a lot more generosity than his immediate family does. Um, with the pandemic uh, and all the things that it's exposed, in what ways would you like Mr. Gossett, for people to acknowledge the elderly, uh, acknowledge our elders in our society that we're not doing right now? Well, back in the good old days when we have the oldest society ever uh, brought to, to, to the bear is the African society. There was something to do at every age in the family. And when you get to the elder, you must be relied upon to tell those stories so that the other people in the, in the generations of the family or the tribe can understand and learn. And thus we progress one generation after another. There's something important for every generation of the, of the family. And uh, we must give those young, those old people a shot to open up their mouths so they feel that they're still important. Um, we continue on that, but that's how we grow. Well, I want to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to be a fan for a moment, just like Sergio was at the very beginning. But uh, you've just been nominated for an Emmy for The Watchmen, which is incredible. Uh, the Watchmen actually leads all Emmy nominees with 26 um, uh, nominations. What appealed to you about that show? Basically the same thing that, that I knew a little bit more than Damon in a sense, because I've been studying that era and that man, Bass Reeves, who, from whom all kinds of stories have been uh, uh, sprung from, he is the most successful marshal in the record of the West. So I know about Bass Reeves. I, I, I know how Bass Reeves created to be Bass Reeves. Uh, there's a film that Sidney Poitier and Eric Belafonte did called Buck and the Preacher, called The Exodusters, was the name of the book. So it's part of our history. So I was able to help Damon uh, to create and flesh out that old man who had all those stories, once again, about what they sh we should do. The most important thing so we have to take the masks off because uh, scars do not heal in the darkness. We take our masks off to heal, to be together once and for all, just like the family used to be and must be again. But there's something to do with every member of the family for our progress.
You know, that show is, um, it's based on a comic book, but it actually kind of, it deals with historical facts. And I think uh, for a lot of people, my generation, we didn't know about Black Wall Street. Um, and we found out about it by watching The Watchmen. Um, how does that- Mm, there's more stories than that, but being able being able to uh, advance, I guess, history, that must mean something to you. Very special, especially this age. I have stories to tell. And I'm very fortunate that I have the ability and the audience to tell them. So now I'm I'm at another level of my. I'm the elder of the family, the storyteller, for what it's worth, and it feels really nice to get that kind of energy mm -hmm. where I can give people, young people like yourself and, and Sergio. So we can come together with a common story and make a progress further on together. Well, you were the first African-American man to win a Best Supporting Actor Oscar for An Officer and a Gentleman. And we have a little bit of a clip. Um, Sheldon, please roll. Thank you. I know why most of you are here. We're not stupid. Before you get to say all what we teach you over at United Airlines, you have to give the Navy six years of your life, sweet pea. Lots of things can happen in six years. Another war can come up in six years. And if you're too peaceful a person to dump napalm on an enemy village where there might be women and children, I'm going to find that out. Understand? Yes, yes sir. sir. Understand? Yes, sir. What's it like to see that uh, image of yourself? It's so fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to say that to some of those guys all my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you actually said that you haven't worked a day in your life. What did you mean no, by that? It's just it's such a pleasure to do, to be creative, to be that close to God and be able to come from your core and get it on camera and see it day in and day out and have that experience. It's priceless. It's a priceless thing to be able to make a living doing what you love to do. You put on a power, put on the planet to do it. And I've had a wonderful, I still am having a wonderful time doing it. You just said something it's that, you just said something that's really interesting to me. You said uh, to be that close to God. Is acting that to you? Yes, ma'am. Yes, it is. Why? Very blessed to be able to do, how many people can you, that you know, make a living of what they put on the planet to do? It's a magic relationship. When you think about when you first started in Hollywood, do you think that there are more opportunities now for black actors in movies or in television? Well, when you say the more opportunities in the established business, the business has changed. The opportunities have always been there, but the audience, the venue for them to get out there in front of the audience was what was lacking. Now the audience is ready to hear it all. It's nice to still be present and, and, and reliable to tell those stories. Mm. So I, so I wake up in the morning and somebody calls and says, how come you don't do a story about the slaves coming from the, 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 the memorial from Gory? I said, funny you should ask. Yeah, there's so many stories. Black Wall Street, funny you should ask. Mm. Bass Reeves, funny you should ask. There's so much more. So much more to tell. Until people say, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> we, we won't say that here. Um, and Sergio, Sergio, you know, when you do a movie, uh, you work on it for uh, a, a while. And then when the movie comes out, you do the red carpets and you do all the press. Mm -hmm. And in this reality that we're in right now, it's very much a different thing. What's it been like yeah. for you to, um, I guess, to get the word out about this movie during a pandemic? Well, I think initially it was, you know, uh, sheer shock. Uh, I think we all have gone through the stages of grief and and uh, yeah, during this pandemic. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we uh, on the twentieth we did our first drive-through red carpet. I did it from my car on on Zoom with a tablet. Um, I get to connect to audiences personally like this through technology. Uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to do many interviews with Mr. Gossett and the rest of the cast. Uh, really connecting to an audience that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do prior to the pandemic. So in some ways, um, the silver lining is that the world has changed and the pandemic has really uh, accelerated change that was already imminent. I think, you know, all this stuff was going to happen anyways. It's just uh, to really look at our lives, our values and how we do things. You know, is it necessary for us to be in a studio together? I mean, it would be lovely. But, you know, Mr. Gossett's in Atlanta. I'm here and you're in Toronto. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, there's so many positives about it. The negatives obviously are clear and, and obvious. Uh, there's people dying, um, which is horrible. 
but uh, so mm -hmm. far it's been uh, it's been a surreal experience beyond any of my wildest dreams. That's for sure. And Mr. Glossop, what's it been like if, for you as a leading actor? Uh, it's 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 oh it's it's, it's like Yogi Berra just said the old basketball old uh, catcher for the New York Yankees. It's like deja vu all over again. I've had it with roots, I had it with officer and gentlemen and other things. It's nice to keep on striking that bell and have people identify for what you put on the screen. Mm. It's a wonderful marriage. This isn't your first Canadian film. What keeps bringing you back to Canada? I love you guys. <laughs> I love the combination of all your cultures and how successful you are. I want to see more of the same. Mm. I see the combinations in you and other people. I think it's very, very exciting that you're growing in that right direction. I'm very proud of you. I like living amongst you, I like uh, doing all of that stuff. So congratulations, Canada. And you actually lived in Toronto, right? I lived in Toronto and I've lived in Vancouver. Well, I mean, Toronto was the better place, right? Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was the Grand Marshal of the Carabana a couple of years back. Oh, really? Because Carabana would have been this past uh, week. It was uh, the hottest, hottest day in Canadian history, boy. I lost 10 pounds on that back of that car. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, a lot of people <laughs> felt it this past weekend, but I guess, um, as Sergio said, as long as people are safe, that's what matters. Sergio, how can people see the Cuban? Well, in Canada, um, we're doing a drive-in release across the country, and apparently there's some theaters also that will be releasing the movie uh, at uh, thecubanmovie.com is where all the listings are. And I give a lot of credit to my uh, distributor, A71, and the whole team that have been able to pull something so remarkable together. And then the U.S., we've gone in uh, 53 cities, I believe, um, via virtual cinemas and uh, some hardtop cinemas as well. So we're very excited. And uh, Mr. Gossett, we're going to be rooting for you for this Emmy. After all the awards that you've received, uh, what is it like to be nominated for yet another one? Uh, it wouldn't hurt as my teacher told me when, he, when he, he told me to try out for this part on Broadway. Go over there and, and submit yourself. It wouldn't hurt. <laughs> so it doesn't hurt. It feels wonderful to know that after all these years, people can still remember my name and remember my work. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. We appreciate both of your time. Uh, it was, it's been very nice to meet you, Mr. Gossett. And Sergio, thank you so much. Congratulations on a lovely film. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love your hair. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it for tonight's agenda in the summer. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO.org. And we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Looking for more of TVO's in-depth current affairs and documentaries? Visit tvo.org slash daily and sign up for our daily newsletter with links to agenda interviews, Steve Bacon's blogs, and preview our upcoming documentaries. That's all at tvo.org slash daily.